general. I have been doing this for a year. And in this one year, I have learned what I do not know. And I have learned that by actually teaching PIO classes and basic JIT classes. And uh, I have taken you know, all the way up to advanced PIO out at e EMI. But when I went around teaching the PIO classes and, and learning stuff and learn, learning from you, I realized there is a big opportunity for us to really help each other. And I started calling around and, and Jane called over to Capio and said, Katie's trying to think about, has this been done before? This network of PIOs that could help each other across the state. And I called Sharon Watson and Sharon's like, yeah, I know what you want to do. I think, I think that it's primed now. I think we can do that. I've been working with Kansas Division of Emergency Management with the IMT teams, with the emergency operation support teams that they're trying to put together. So I think I have some foundational stuff that will allow this idea to get off the ground. But what I wanted to present to you was it's just kind of the concept of what I'm looking for and what maybe you've been looking for. And then we could start a conversation about maybe you've tried this and you ran into a pitfall and we could bring that up and we could say, okay, if that's the pitfall, this is how we could fix it. And if the, in the end, what we have is a CAPIO emergency network, uh, Kansas Association of Public Information Officers who are there to help each other during emergencies under the direction of KDEM because that's where it all needs to come down from. So KDEM's on board. I think we can, we can make this happen. So I'd like, if you can see this screen here on the right, I'd like just to walk you through what I'm, just kind of again, the concept of this in a big picture. So basically what it is, it's us. It's Kansas Public Information Officers, which would become a network of regional PIOs to assist each other during times of crisis. How? Well, we could help each other by monitoring social media monitoring big media, media coordination, organizing press conferences. If this uh, crisis became big enough that you would need a press conference and you just need some help. Our folks from Riley County could tell you from their experience with the mass shooting, it'd be nice to have somebody to help you just be at the door and direct the media to where they need to be. Somebody to keep track of rumors and misinformation, responding agencies like the gas company is coming, somebody to coordinate with her on, on your behalf answer phone calls, help write press statements, help write social media, filling in so you can take a break. If you've ever been in a long-lived event, that is so important, just to clear your head and be able to take a break. So that's what I'm looking at. It's just ways, and some of these would be, we could do this virtually, where we wouldn't have to leave our home or our office, but we could just say, you know what, I'm here, I am able to help you do these things, and we would identify you, identify your strengths, have that on a roster, have a, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but have a regional coordinator so that if you're in trouble, you call this one person and they can send out the tree to get you the assist that you're asking for. So we would identify those people, uh, you would identify, we would make this roster, you would let us know if you feel comfortable taking on this role. We would wanna make sure you have at least basic PIO training maybe basic JIC training, just so you understand the concept of what the PIO is working with, especially if they're working with an incident management team, so knowing what they have to deal with. We would create an on-call schedule. So let's say Julie, who's behind the pillar over there, Julie, you're the regional coordinator for Johnson County, let's say, but you need to take a vacation, so we would have a backup person, so you wouldn't always have to be on call. So we would help identify that. And then what I'd really like to do is create kind of a DEF CON, I'd call it a KCOM system, where if you're the PIO in, in Riley County and you're having this incident and you think, I, I, I got this, I can handle this right now. So you would just let your regional uh, PIO person know, I'm at level one, just kind of keep your eye on me, but I, I've got this. Then, uh-oh, I've moved up to level two. Could you get a team to help monitor media for me and send that in? So nobody really has to leave their offices yet, and this is still free. This isn't costing anybody any money. And then level three, I would suggest, would be a large-scale event. You need a PIO network in your city, in your uh, JIC, or in your EOC to help you. And at that point, when we move up to a level three, 
that's when we get into funding issues. So I kind of ran down that road with KDEM, and we can work that out through IMTs, emergency management team, EMTs, emergency management teams, or a new concept that they're coming up with, which is emergency operations center support teams. And the way I think about it is an IMT, are you familiar with IMTs? Anybody not familiar with IMTs? An IMT is a very trained group of people, about 18 people, that deploy to help you. If your county EM, emergency manager, says, I need an IMT, and the state sends an IMT your way, and they have all the ESFs included in that. If you don't need the whole IMT, what we're hoping then is the emergency managers could say, I need to pick a la carte. I need just a planning chief, or I need a, a PIO. And then that's where we would already be trained, already have the network, and then those emergency operations center support teams could say, let's turn to CAPIO. They've got a support team in that region. They can fill that PIO function or that ESF 15 function. So I've taken a map of Kansas that was already divided up into these regions. I don't know if we would keep it this way because region one would be really populated. We've got Manhattan, we've got uh, Topeka, we've got Wolf Creek, and we've got the entire Kansas City metro there. But I'm just going to use that for as an example, as a starting place. So if we went into Region 1, this is where the state agencies are located. And I apologize, I know that's small. But these are the latest report of PIOs at the state agencies. So you would have this, and by the way, this Prezi, it's, the nice thing about it is it's shareable. I can just give you a login and you can log in and see it, but I don't think it's very functional. Capio is talking about a list serve. I think that would be a more functional way, but this just so you can conceptually see what I've. And Katie, what's the source of this list? Uh, we get it from the, the governor's office. Well, does this mean it's voluntary from the Yeah, this is sent so out to us weekly or monthly. In the uh, yes. The last one I received. Again, this is just concept, so we'll get into the weeds on this in a bit. So here's the list of the county PIOs, and I would include in this roster who the KDEM coordinator is for that region, and then who, are, who we identify as the CAPIO emergency network coordinator in this region. And then we would want to identify somebody who was willing to take the role of the county PIO, and I know some counties have a lot of PIOs, and maybe you would, just like an on-call schedule, want to break that up seasonally or weekly, however, whoever is going to be in charge of that county, and I just took liberties here, like put down Angie's name from Coffee, and Trent from Johnson, <coughs> and Crystal from Potawatomi, and me from Shawnee, just as an example, but there would be more information here, all the contact information, and what we identify as our comfortable specialty. Like I would not put down web design under me, but media relations I'd be comfortable with. I'd put that down. So you would just know, okay, I really need, I need Breeze because she is a whiz at the internet. I would, you know, Breeze, Breeze would hopefully write that down as her thing. And a place to share photos of what's going on that we can capture. <coughs> also to identify in each region what the major uh, businesses are, and we should all, and we teach this in basic PIO, have made contacts with these people, um, but you would want to know who they are in your region in case of a disaster that might somehow bring you two together in a quick relationship. It's great if you can already go ahead and start that relationship ahead of time. All right, that concludes my overall concept. Can we open it up for discussion? Is I know that we have some regional groups that have already started. Do you Number one, think that this is needed. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, <coughs> then what I would think that the next step would be is to have you send us your name, contact information, what your specialty is, and then we'll create a roster and send that around and we'll fill in the holes. Um, working still closely with KDEM to figure out exactly where we fit in the funding tree, because if you are deployed to go help somebody. We want you to be paid for that, that time. So that piece, I'll kind of leave it in their hands. What are some other pitfalls that you see that I haven't thought of? Um, well, the rural areas sometimes don't have people who do the PIO work part-time, or they don't know that they're doing PIO work. Exa that's where this whole idea started and from. I really think um, if you talk to like the um, Highway Patrol, people that are within the regional, they might know who some of those people are. 
we need to get them training because the lady during the fire in the Starbucks fire this year is normally a lawyer who's been trained to with keep information in all of a sudden she was given roles PIO and she's like I don't know I don't know how to reverse my role here <laughs> All right, so getting the training out to the PIOs, the, the sudden PIOs, right. getting them identified. So let's think Greensburg. Sure. Okay. I would, all emergencies started in local. So we would, the, would start with the local PIO. If that local PIO is overwhelmed, they would call the regional CAPIO PIO. And I think it would be great if that regional PIO could take that on. Because when you are in the middle, and use a military term, the middle of boom, your family's affected, you're, you're affected. It's really hard to think down to those minute details. But if you have somebody who's just a little bit removed, who's calm, whose house hasn't just been destroyed, they could come up with that list. But a lot of that, I think, should be pre-thought out, you know, like an on-call schedule, so you know who's on call and what their specialties are. Um, in our department, when we know we're in that season of disasters, which I hate to say there's even a season, it seems a little slow right now, which is lovely, uh, we, we divide up into teams, so we know if this team is deployed, this team can rest, comes in, you know, so we have like three teams that circle around to cover that and if we could think that through ahead of time on a regional basis that would take some of the planning out you come back to here and I'll come back to you so we started this work in the higher ed community about a year and a half ago and it's really come from two places so at the behest of a college president the emergency management folks have been getting together for about a year now and thinking specifically about resource sharing so what we found is where some universities like is a great example, are very well connected to both their city and their county. That hyper-geographic <coughs> local um, response approach doesn't necessarily address the needs of the higher ed, ed institution in the way that other higher ed institutions would be able to step in and support in responding to that emergency. So we're in the process of, of crosswalking what this type of work that's happening in <coughs> larger driven by emergency management in local geographies to statewide across higher ed. And for the most part, I've, I've kind of stepped aside and let those emergency management folks think about, they're asking all these same questions. Do we want to take on this national MOU that's well known and respected? What kind of structure should we have? How are we going to move forward with this work? And in the recent weeks, I've been talking to them specifically about what we've been doing on the PIO side to say when do we interface and when does your emergency management planning expand just, just a nudge to think about that external communications moment and the fact that you need us to be that yeah. front line. Well, I think what you're hitting on, Breeze, is exactly the point of teaching the emergency managers. A lot of them don't think they need a PIO in some of the rural areas, so teaching the importance of PIO and having those PIOs trained and ready to go. Is that the point you're making? Yes, and I think the other thing that I would raise as a concern is that it's not a one and done. So I audit and confirm PIO at all 32 institutions every August. Yeah, I, and that's I, a big task. And if you haven't done that with media, you should do that with media too. Your, your email addresses to the TV stations are probably not working. You should always audit that. The other big challenge is going to be selling it to the elected government people who employ us, that it's okay for us to leave and go help somebody else on their diet. That's a very good point I hadn't thought of. So, um, do you have any solutions? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, man, back there, yes. <laughs> Got you right when you took a bite. Another comment that I would make. Connie Johnson, Nancy, and I sat down at the end of the 2016 conference. How do we put together a database 
based on emergency management regions of PIOs yes. because we felt horrible after Aaron and Melissa gave their presentation on Texas. Yes. That they didn't have anybody to go to and we were like, we're a statewide organization, we could help them. Yes. And so we sat down and talked about that. But the biggest challenge for us was time and having one of us be able to sit down and figure out who all these people are that we need to get into the database and then technology. We weren't really sure how to do that um, you know, we thought about Google Docs, we thought about, you know, something, but it would be really important if there's some way that through the cloud or something that people can go in and get you that information where it's not all stored, you know, on your desktop or in, you know, in KDEM. Um, how, how do we have, I, I agree with you with the ICS and the chain and, and how it needs to get out, but sometimes if we can, how, how do we get We need a share drive is what we need. But the, the problem with that is when you lose internet, um, then what to do? So you need to print that off on a regular basis so you have those numbers in front of you in that list. This is, all you need is Google Chrome, but we work in a government agency, and to get this Google Chrome up on this board for you today was an act of technical <laughs> sophistication beyond what we should have to do. Well, and what I did after that happened, and I didn't get a, a list of, of our members, but I talked to our GIS guy, and he created a map, like in two minutes, yes. of where each per each PIO is located in the state, and then when you click on the dot, it shows their phone number, their, you could put their skill set. What, what, what platform is that on? Um, Azure, R3, yeah, R3. Yeah, yeah. yeah, probably Esri. And is that R3. available to everybody? Yes, you have a login, a you just your log into yourself. it, and you're, so, I mean, he created it, it's ready, it, it's just, I mean, you can tweak it or use it or whatever. It's, okay. But uh, that would be and it's helpful. Devin just whispered in my ear, she's got the technology that can yeah, we do have some systems. We have some voluntary groups within the state, and we have some through the American Institute of Architects, organizations like that. They work through our comprehensive resource management system, and we're able to upload information in there. We also have a system that's able to do call out. So as Katie evolves with this process, we can look at some of that to support you guys. That's we would great. be happy to do that. Yay. Yes. Um, I just want to share something we're doing in Cali County because if, if we're looking at this from a county perspective and having a point of contact, I, I can foresee getting into some perp type issues. But in Cali, what we started doing last year, and Erin's familiar with this, she presented our group, but we created a PIO working group that's being run through our county um, emergency management division. So our, our emergency director saw the um, looked at what happened in the past and he took it on himself to start reaching out to the other PIOs that he knew of. And we're trying to grow it from there at the local level. We meet quarterly, a month offset from Capio. And but what's great about that system is it's creating those interactions you talked about, but not everybody has to be active in Capio, taking the training. You get a couple people that are like me that will come to these meetings and then bring it back to them. Um, those are the kind of, you know, the school PIOs that's got other duties or whomever. And it's working well for us, but because we have that framework, it would be easy for us to give you a name and contact because it would either be Brian, our EOC director, or it would be whoever, you know, we have as the chair of the group or whatever. But then you let it devolve down from there. Then when we have the crisis and it's level one, we've already got our group in place. We are already working on how are we going to be in a jig locally and how are we going to respond. And then if we need to ramp it up, we've already got everyone together to make that call and see what resources we need. And I would encourage all of you at least reach out to your county emergency managers and see if, if they thought about that. That way they don't have to do the PIO specialty, but they can start building that network to support mm -hmm. them um, when there's an issue. And then we have this network to fall back on, too. So what, what I hear you saying is that you've already got it for your immediate geographical area, yeah. and it's going to work for you and guys. And then the would you see a Capio <laughs> EN being a next step? If you guys got overwhelmed, you could reach up to another level? Okay, uh, the only reason I mentioned the training is so important. Be, in order to get the funding, uh, we have to make sure that they're trained. So, and everybody should have basic PIO who's gonna call themselves a PIO. So I think if we keep it just at that level, would that cause a problem with any of your? No, most of them have had that or they're planning to take it. But you, okay. know, you get some people that show like uh, Winfield Police and one of their junior SRO officers meeting with PIO plus. <laughs> yeah. So you get that disconnect between communities like you said, <coughs> 
start getting the group together and people start talking about, oh, I put basic PIO or a hey, basic PIO is coming up, it, I think it helps to build those sorts of things when the pressure isn't on. But we're also doing local training. Um, they started integrating us in their emergency management tabletop exercises. I participated in two of those this summer. It was really the first time we had PIOs in the room that just had their other ESMs and kind of handled PIO stuff on their own. Um, so we're starting to kind of do more of that. Sure. And probably our next training will be an actual practice and shift when we come together and go through the motions of that, just so we have some concepts. Great. Great. We did that same thing in Douglas County. Um, I, I kind of coordinated that. Yeah. Um, and we also did it in Leavenworth. Melissa, did they still do it in Leavenworth? Uh, there's a county line thing that's that needs to meet. It doesn't matter for the years. But that, that scenario worked really well. And then also, when, we, when I was in Lawrence, we rewrote um, ESF 15. Uh, and we made it in such a way that we could replace Douglas County with any other county in the state of Kansas. And so we have that available. Um, to the gentleman who spoke right before you, you brought up two points that I think we should maybe take a moment and get in the weeds on because I think it would be helpful to flesh it out. You said turf wars, and you also said that you're working together at these training things, which is building relationships, and I think that's going to be the key to avoiding the turf war. Um, I would think as a group of professionals, we should be able to say, you know, I'm just here to help. How can I help you? Who's ever scheduled to take the lead if needed. Um, but if that lead PIO for the region changes, then anybody who's feeling like you're in my turf will forget their turn. <laughs> you'll have your opportunity. You'll have your season. Would that, do you think, because I would hate for this to become a turf war and a, a source of frustration. I want this to be a source of, oh, thank God, the Calvary is here. Yeah, you know, so that's not competitive. Exactly. <clears throat> Very well put. That's, we haven't discussed that, but I will bring that back as an idea. But also, oh, we're trying to focus, uh, focus on special. People are the, you know, everyone's got something to really test at. We're trying to do that locally. So I know I'm better at writing press releases than I would be on camera. Or um, our, 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 our school district person is amazing on Twitter, and I just haven't touched it. Sure, sure. We, we're already trying to sub-specialize in our network so that that's already done. You know, in that. You're not thinking about your organizational responsibility. You're thinking about your role within the community. Yes. Um, that's what I hope it is. OK. Yeah, anybody else have a thought on turf wars? Well, not so much on turf wars, but we were, somebody was talking about getting local governments to mm -hmm. participate. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe you and I could work together and running through our JA folks and getting some standard MOA type things uh, that have been vetted through both state and federal okay. legal stuff to serve as templates to maybe help you with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds great. Reese? Well, I think a couple of the comments have echoed on this and get to your point about turf wars and that what infrastructure systems are already in place farther down the chain. Mm -hmm. So I think if I do what would make something like this really successful, it would probably identify where to draw that line. But it doesn't necessarily include everyone. Right. And, and perhaps I'm um, sensitive to this because of the scope of our system. But, you know, you take a, an institution like KU Med, well, they have their own emergency response, but they're not the main university. And depending on the nature of the emergency that, that's at hand, it can use Lawrence-based PIO or the Board of Regents PIO. There, there might be other right. political or structural decisions that were made as far as who should take lead there. So I think I would envision a network that, that utilized the triage that a county or a, or a statewide system had to tap into. Okay opposed to trying to drill down all the way to that PIO level where I don't want you reaching out right. to the third tier PIO of the six PIOs at KU Med <laughs> when you, because you happen to know their name and phone number when that's not the infrastructure that's been set up. And I feel like I'm hearing some of that from I, the and, I and others. And I think the key there is all emergencies started in local. So, so you are local and the local PIO is in charge until you ask for help or your emergency manager asks for additional help. So in those situations where you already have a process, then go with your process. It's only just know that there is an umbrella out there if you need it to help you. But yeah, I think we always, you know, it starts local, you deal with your own processes local internally, and then whatever you've worked out it, with your company or your state or your county, and then just know that we've got you. 
if you need us. We're trained, we're ready, we're here to help if you need us. And that's all I think needs to be in my book. Yes. Um, just a, just thinking out loud is, I mean, are we just going to limit this to Capio people? Because I, I mean, I think it's some organizations don't, might not let their PIOs be a part, but they have all the training. And you know, I mean, I think it'd be great to open it up to everyone. But I, I mean, okay, that's your thought. I, I just. Well, I, I like Capio because it's... Well, I mean, and that would be the base, but I'd hate to see somebody like a, an organization they can't join go, like, Capio. you can't join <laughs> It'd be a way to build the base of Capio. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, join I, Capio I, and you can be I'm part just, of it. like, thinking of yeah. that. Yeah, but that's good. We'll, we'll make sure to make a note of that. All right, well, this one I think was a good first conversation on it. Thank you for your input and for listening through it all. Um, I kind of went out of order. I wanted Devin to give you a tour of our EOC first, but um, thank you for being patient and leading with us through this process. But let me give it over to Devin for a moment. She's going to show you what we do in this EOC, and then we'll show you our example of going Facebook Live from in here, which was a pretty big deal for us because not invited in here because they haven't always treated us nice so we learned we don't need the media we'll broadcast it ourselves and so this was our first year doing that and I think we had um, some pretty good steps on that so here's Devin first of all I'm really excited about Katie's upcoming project I think that'll be great we do get a lot of comments from the counties that they do need this type of support it is something where even if they have one PIO or maybe even if they're lucky to monitoring Facebook just by itself is incredibly daunting. And we've coordinated through mutual aid multiple times now, people just to monitor Facebook for these counties. So I'm excited now that we're going to have this resource in place. So this should help out a lot of counties. And I think elected officials might be a little more positive than you would think. A lot of them like to brag when you guys go out and do stuff. Yep, my person went to that county and they were involved in that response. So it is kind of handy to have that behind you, but I'm really excited. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I don't really know you guys well, so can I kind of get a feel for who in here has worked in either a state or a local emergency operations center? Oh, federal. federal works too, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> wow, very cool. What incident? Um, Hurricane Katrina. Awesome. Rita, Alika, after that. Um, can you hear okay back there? Honduras. Okay. Wow, so a lot. Um, the sexual assault scandal at Lackland okay. Air Force Base. So. Very cool. All right, so some of this you guys are already going to know, so I apologize if I bore you. Others, this will be new, and maybe someday you'll wind up in here working with us, which would be awesome too. So our State Emergency Operations Center is a smidge different than a County Emergency Operations Center, and that's because the state never manages an incident. That's something sometimes the, the perception is the state's running the show. We're not. KDEM exists to support counties. Our main function is to support a county when they are out of resources to meet the needs of a disaster. So what we do is we come in here with our partners and we're actually what you would refer to as a multi-agency coordination center. And what that means is we here at KDEM, we don't know everything. So we've got to rely on folks at KDHE, Department of Children and Families, American Red Cross, or the Fire Marshal's Office to help make sure we can address all the needs. You can kind of look up and see the signs above you. We are designed in emergency management support functions, so this covers everything from comms to public information and everything in between. So at your front desk, where many of you are seated, that is where our partners would sit. We don't have a chart in here, unfortunately. Our chart's in the hallway. But we have individuals from the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the Kansas Fire Marshal's Office, Department of Children and Families, as I mentioned. We have some voluntary organizations active in disaster that do come here. We have Salvation Army, American Red Cross, and representatives of Kansas Go Out itself. And we also have groups like Kansas Corporation Commission and a few other private entities. Generally speaking, though, the main percentage of this is state agencies that come in. It depends entirely upon the disaster. For instance, when we were dealing with the Neotache disaster last fall, we were very KDHE heavy when normally we may have just one KDHE rep in here, but we were dealing with a water emergency. So we kind of suit the needs for the disaster. We have various levels of activation. And again, that's dependent upon the situation. There's some events where we may have had small flooding. So I might have basic KDM staff in here. So we might have plans or logistics or just a few folks in here to kind of run things within response and recovery itself. 
Now as stuff starts to grow, we bring in additional folks. So if we're having something with a lot of transportation problems or a snowstorm where we know people are getting stuck on the highways, we bring in Kansas Highway Patrol. So that's the nice part about this is we can design it however we need to to fit that situation. There are instances where we have everybody, and I mean everybody, that is listed in our response plan in here. About probably maybe not even 10 minutes after we got the call that the fire was headed into Hutchinson, we did a call down of everybody in our list. It did not matter if you had nothing to do with fire. You got a phone call and were told to come in here because that's what happens when you think a town might get burned. We had complaints about that, but that's the thing. Sometimes you don't know how the situation is going to evolve, so sometimes we have to bring everybody in. And something like that is incredibly PIO heavy because like Katie and I were both trying to monitor stuff within social media. She has her staff monitoring, and the folks on the ground, they're fighting a fire. So again, I'm really excited about the support. I'm sorry, because I'm the one that's supposed to monitor stuff sometimes, and sometimes that's really hard to do. So I am thrilled about you guys. All right, sorry about my handling. <laughs> she just threw this at me yesterday for her new project, so I'm still in the excited phase. <laughs> so you guys are my new best friend. Yeah. All right, so like I said, we have various and assorted levels. We activate with our partners. And then back here, you will see we have our National Guard partners and also our logistics section. Within KDM, we do have a logistics section. However, that is widely supported by the National Guard. We're partners, it works out fantastic, especially during events where we're dealing with individuals stranded on roadways, things like that. They are amazing to go out and help us help these individuals. With our random strange spring blizzard, that was a huge, huge asset. We had a lot of National Guard folks in here supporting us. We also have our planning section over there, and we also have spaces for our federal partners. This can be the Environmental Protection Agency, FEMA, basically anybody we need for that situation. So again, it's an evolving situation, and just depends who we call in. And that decision's made with our policy group and our Emergency Operations Center manager. In addition to our basic EOC functions, I was talking about we have our JIC, which is right over here. And I'll let Katie kind of brief on how the JIC functions. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so during the um, Starbucks fire, you are all familiar with the Starbucks fire, right? This Kansas's biggest fire in our history. Um, I was supposed to be in there, but I sat right here. I, I had to hear everything. I didn't know that I could have called a PIO from each of those agencies and had them sitting in there with me so I didn't have to be in here. But this is where the deputy director of the emergency management division sits. So Angie's sitting here, I'm gonna sit right beside her. And I'm, I'm like this the whole time because I needed situation awareness. But I, this is where I'm saying, even though I've been doing this for a year, I have so much to learn because instead of extracting information from her, I should have been getting information to give to her. And that's what we do in the JIC, and that's what we will be doing now in the JIC. This, this monitoring, this gathering of information, just so she can have better situation awareness. Even if she doesn't use it, as long as she, you know, I can give her a sheet of paper that says, these are the reports I'm getting from trained PIOs on the field or near the field, and use this information. So a two-way street is incredibly important when you're working during an emergency. And I'm learning as I go, but that's one I want to make sure that none of us miss. That it's not just... Um, give me your information, I'll send it out on, on social media. It's let right. me listen out here and let me be a source for you, you know, a, a credible source for her. Um, and so this is where I'm supposed to work. They're like pushing me back through the door, get back in your cage. But this is a room that's got telephone lines, monitors, maps, whiteboards. And so I can put an ESF partner from any of the state agencies in here with me and they can be talking directly to their agency and then communicating with me and we can coordinate on releases. Even though we write the releases probably just the same as in your organization, I write the release or our team writes up the release and we give it to Devin for confirmation that it's approved, that everything is right. And we just don't want to send anything out that's not right. And so Devin is sitting right here and she has a, a staff also that helps to make sure that what we've uh, what we're about to send out is accurate. So it's teamwork on both sides. We're getting ready in my dream world to switch from this room to a room that's behind this wall and we're gonna build a new wall here. It's about five times as big as this room. And what I'm hoping for in my dream jick is that we'll have the 
uh, overall situation on a screen in front of us so that everybody can see it. I can have all agency partners at a table, at a V-shaped table where we can all see each other, and then monitors that would put up the rumors, the misinformation, the truth, and whether or not we have sent that out and corrected it and, and who's in charge of that. So just my, my dream jick coming, coming to be. Something that will probably help with her dream jick and that makes our jick unique is we have a nuclear power plant in the state. So if that event should ever go down and happen, we are very, very heavy within public information for that. And it is drilled consistently many, many times a year. And we even have graded exercises where the JIC has to show certain capabilities. So that is why that room is incredibly important. It also plays that support role within that incident. I'm so. going to pull up um, kind of a view of our, I think it's up, I just need to get it here. Oh, I haven't hit it from here. How do I run that from here? We have the strangest screens. So Katie cannot see the screen she's actually working on. Right now. Oh, you need to mirror your screen. Is, am I up there? And um, once you find your mouse, mouse. You can does anybody see a mouse? Move slide over more. Mm -hmm. On the screen. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Uh, 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 and it's the most frustrating thing. They just changed the song. Now, okay, now look down here at these buttons. Show me me. Do you see me anywhere? Your face? Yeah, to the left. Is this you? Is this me? <laughs> yeah, that could be me. Can't see a thing. All right, let's see if this works. Okay. <laughs> Do we have that little speaker thing that works? There's one with oh, this one. I'm sorry you can't hear it, but I just wanted to give you some ideas of ways that you might be able to do this back in your. One of the things we're doing here is we weren't sure we were on live, so <laughs> Matt had another phone, and when he saw the Facebook go live, he pointed to me.
We need your best friends. We're also like this is the year row they gave us a fire. If you couldn't hear it over there, she just blamed Oklahoma on our fires. Okay. Rightfully so. I know this is going long, but to get your most viewers on Facebook Live, you need to go for about 10 to 15 minutes. So what you'll see, I'm dying because I know you guys are getting bored, but if you'll just bear with me, I want to show you how I've set this up so that I've contacted all the reporters to let them know I'm doing this. So they've already sent me questions, so I'm answering questions that I know they want to know the answer to. So that's why I'm spending as much time on this. We do, but Wi-Fi doesn't work very well in here. That's why we're having trouble going live. You guys talked about external mics. It was a big part of that big yes. live yes. session at the conference. Yes, that, yes, we're on. working on that. We're going to hook them directly up to our phones. And also, since we shot this, and since we taught this to the Kansas National Guard public information officers, it's called UPARS, we, at that time we taught them to turn horizontally. Since then, Facebook has come out with no keep your phones vertical. Really? Yeah. This would have been our second event. I think our first one was the January, late January snowstorm that we ever did that time. Yeah, I go. That's what I was going to share with you. I go around to everybody who I know we're going to talk to, tell them what I'm going to ask them, um, ask them if they have any graphics they want us to zoom in on, a phone number they want to be sure to share so that I'm ready to prep them or prompt them to do that. We also, Matt, um, Captain Luck here, and I do this together, and so we coordinate how we're going to walk backwards, where we're going to go. So we have that all plotted out. In addition to that. Angie has secured all the information she does not want seen. So we, we do yes, a room sweep right. to make sure that's there's nothing. That's very important. People, you don't want people having stuff on their screen that is not public information. We do a lot, as you can see, with the big posters on the wall. Some of that stuff we don't want everybody to see. So we made sure we covered them up and things like that. So it's a little bit of a hassle for the EOC when I say I'm going to go live. They're like, <laughs> yay. <laughs> but it's better than the media in our case. And um, it pulls back the curtain to the, to the people at home um, to let them see what we're doing for them back here at the state Citizens level. liked it. We had positive comments about it. And also counties liked being able to see what was going on. But if you have any suggestions on how we could do better, uh, or any questions about what we're doing that you would like to learn from, that's a, another great discussion I'd love to share with you and learn from you. But that microphone reads is definitely going to happen. Did anyone repurpose your footage? Or was Facebook your... We just did it on Facebook, but it got shared a ton, a lot of shares. So it, it had a, ended up having a huge reach. Did you offer it to me, or would you consider offering it? They, they know it's there because they're on the phone with me right okay. before I go. And, and if I'm late, they're like, oh, we're waiting for it. So they're okay. doing something with it. Oh, that's Zach running camera. So that's uh, another one of our soldiers running camera on this day. And he's just started asking questions, which I loved the um, authenticity of that. You know, he just had a question to ask. So just like in 
as Julie, and Julie, I hate that I can't see you, just as in television, Julie and I worked together in television for two decades. In television, people get bored with the talking head, so if you are going to go, have some type of visual that you can go to. We went to the maps, we went to pictures, but even this becomes a little bit long. Um, and without live editing capacity to be, or capabilities to be able to put pictures in, this is the best we could do. But any time that you might think, I know this person's going to talk for a long time, let me have a graphic I can go to. Just, just kind of think ahead on ways that you can make it visually interesting. If there were in a military uniform, they're going to talk for a long time. <laughs> and acronyms. We, we, say, we try to be yeah. an acronym-free environment. The good news is we've got precipitation coming that will also help I had to throw a little weather in. It's just the <laughs> thing I do. <laughs> Yeah, and like I'm not, I do not know how to make a website. So knowing that you do, I, you're now my new best friend. So <laughs> that's, um, we can learn so much from each other and, and we should really draw on that. Well, that concludes our presentation here in the state EOC. Thank you so much for coming and, and